As we come into the presence of our Lord, let's begin with a prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to come and to be in your house and to experience you in a special, uh, just a special way. Uh, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place and to fill each of us so that we might offer to you the best of our hearts and our minds, uh, our voices. So come Holy Spirit, lead us in worship. Help us to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. see me hanging on to this like crazy until I still get the flow down right I have to watch it when you stop directing I know it's time to come up here <laughs> and and let okay let, let me apologize to the choir um, anybody notice something that got left out last Sunday guys don't let me do that um, my 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 view on on the music is that uh, the music will lead us into the presence of the Holy Spirit better than anything um, I'm not going to preach you into the presence of the Holy Spirit you know that's that might preach you to sleep but uh, the music leads us into the Holy Spirit the the music is a co-equal to everything that goes on here uh, as much if not more important than than the sermon uh, Billy Graham used to like to say that when we get to heaven there'll be no more preaching 
but there's still going to be worship going on. So uh, I'm going to be out of a job, and these guys are still going to be, you know, so I'm, I'm going to get them a little Nerf gun. If I skip it again, they're going to pop me in the back of the head. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, we had a, a great meeting this past Wednesday for the vision, and we're probably going to have another one in uh, probably a couple of weeks uh, as we go home and we just pray and, and think about what, uh, what God wants to do here at our church. And so, uh, but I, I just, I was overwhelmed by the number of people that came and were part of that and was just really blessed by all that. Um, this Wednesday, we're going to have a worship team meeting. And again, it's just to kind of get together and let's talk about what we do here on Sunday mornings. We, we want what we do here to be as, as tight as possible. Now, we're not ever going to be perfect, uh, but we really want, we just want God to be glorified and people to be um, saved and healed and and so we want to do everything we possibly can on our part so that's what that's for uh, church council meeting then is uh, Thursday August the 11th at 630 and so uh, I just invite invite everybody that's part of that to, to, to come and be there um, am I missing anything as far as announcements yes ma'am Amen. Yeah, the list is, is on the back here. Um, so we had a great VBS uh, a couple of weeks back, and so we're going to get to hear a little bit about how that goes. So I'm going to invite Nancy to come up. Last Saturday, we had Bible school, and our theme was Jesus Loves Me. We had a great turnout, 12 kids and a lot of volunteers. Most of the decorating was done by the kids during, in Children's Church. They colored posters and we put them on bulletin boards and so they got to be involved with that also. One of the highlights for me was one of our visitors or guests. It was a little girl from Ukraine. She'd only been in the United States about three months and she spoke very little English. And we had all our kids introduce themselves to her. And by the end of the day, the little girls were holding her hand. And that was just a blessing to me and to see her. We started out about 8.45 with registration. And the parents came in and filled out the registration and consent forms. And we had the kids write their names on their name badges. Crafts was a big hit. I'll show you we painted pillowcases and they all did their creative designs. We had Noah's Ark, we had self-portraits, we had crosses and hearts and you just wouldn't believe how beautiful they were. We're going to show you a video after myself and Donna and Connie get up and tell you more about it so you can see exactly what we did. We had lunch was hot dogs and chips, desserts, water and juice, and all of that was donated by you. Sunday school classes, United Methodist women, individuals, and people that just wanted to donate. And I'm gonna let Donna come up and tell you about story time and music, and then Connie will talk to you about how hot it was that day, for one thing. And other things and then we'll show you the video but I want to thank everyone that had a part in this year's Bible school and I think it had been about three years is that right about three years since we were able to have Bible school because of COVID and it was such an outreach and a blessing I want to start out by saying I was blown away 
with the number of volunteers we had. Um, I, in the beginning, I was concerned that we were going to have anybody want to help. And we had so many people. And I feel like that each child was able to have conversations with an adult, that each child was able to, to uh, go home feeling that Jesus loves them and that we do too. I want to tell you first of all about music. Uh, Beverly, she was our song leader and she did a tremendous job. And uh, the young and the young at heart <laughs> uh, had a great time with music. Lisa was our storyteller and there was a lot of prayerful consideration went into her stories because I, we, everything blended together. Um, she had activities, things planned out. It was, it was just, it was wonderful. We were on the edge of our seats. And when it was all said and done, we even had somebody want more stories. It was wonderful. Thank you all very much. I had the pleasure of getting to do the activities, and yes, it was hot. And Sharon Grindstaff, such a smart gal, she said, hey, Connie, let's get out them big old fans. I said, oh, I think we shall. So the kids, after lunch, after they got all sugared up, after they had their cupcakes and their cookies and their more cookies and their hot dogs and then more cupcakes, they were bouncing off the wall. They were ready for activities. So we went out to the play area down at the covered section, and it is all decorated. And we did some fun things. We had about five stations, and the one thing we wanted to do was to make sure that we tied playtime into worship. And so they had um, several games that they could play. One was called God's Rules. So they'd spin the wheel, and it'd land on a number, and we'd turn that over, and it'd say, what God would expect you to do. And we'd read that, and then they got a prize. So uh, every child got a Bible, which was wonderful, that was provided by the Gideons. And then we played another spin game, which had Bible verses that they should always cling to, and it would help them through times, you know, children are smart, they're real smart, and you plant that seed, and that's so important to plant that seed. So by tying activities in with Bible stories is, and the verses is so important. And you'd be amazed what those children remember. They remember. They're, they're like little sponges. They soak it all up. And you hope they carry that with them. So planting seeds is wonderful, but it was hot. It was just so hot. But the kids didn't mind. They didn't mind at all. They ran as hard as they could, and they paired up with a buddy. And there was a lot of hand-holding, just like Nancy said. And it was so cute. The biggest thing for me is seeing the smiles on their face. They were so happy. They painted a rock um, out here at the park. They put their touch on it. And it's amazing. We had one child, and I think it was Abel. Where's Beverly? that painted the blood. I was amazed. He painted the blood on the cross. He understood what that meant. And that was amazing and very touching to my heart. So I thank all the volunteers. They had a lot of smiles on their face and a little bit of sweat too, but everybody had a good time. And it was so wonderful to do outreach. So thank you, and I was privileged to be a part of it, and I want to thank Nancy. She did an awesome job. That was amazing. I was kind of like Dawn. I was really kind of skeptical in the beginning if we could pull it off, if we have enough volunteers. But, you know, this church has a remarkable ability to come together, and um, we did it that day, and I thank you.
We are going to have to have an exorcism downstairs. Somebody brought in two Florida Gators chairs. And so I'm, I will make sure we have the Tennessee Auburn chairs here next year. But um, the, the glow on the kids' faces were just phenomenal. And um, the glow on the faces of the volunteers were phenomenal as well. And, you know, it's always more fun to play the football game than sit in the stands and watch the football game. And so as we, as we move forward with our vision and, and we grow and we're trying to, to reach out, I just encourage you to, you know, you're gonna, you, you sit at home, you go, gosh, that's going to be such a pain in the rear end to have to come do that. But when you come and, and, and be a part of what we do here, um, God blesses you in so many ways. So I just encourage you to, to, to keep volunteering. We had a great group, and I appreciate every one of them. So uh, as we come now to, uh, to celebrate our faith journey as we return back to God, his tithes and our offerings.
it is always a special time. Uh, wh where's where's Robert and Sandy? Y'all here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, okay, go ahead and come on up. Uh, Robert and Sandy Edwards have uh, decided that they want to. Uh, they've been coming here longer than I have, which which I mean I've been coming very long, but uh, so they've been a part of this congregation for a while now. They want to take that one next step and actually join uh, in membership with Grace Chapel. So. Uh, I'm going to invite you, and yes, if anyone would like to come stand with them, please, please come and do that. And I'm going to invite you to turn to page 38 in your hymnal. There is a section where we respond. Uh, okay, so now Robert is a United Methodist by, from another church. Sandy is joining, she's becoming a United Methodist, so uh, the first question is to you, uh, as we make you a Methodist here, uh, as a member of Christ Universal Church, which you already are, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Yes. Amen. Uh, okay, you're now Methodist. Hallelujah. <laughs> so now we're going to make you Methodist uh, members of the Grace Chapel Methodist Church. So now, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Yes. Okay. Uh, you are members. Now, to those of us, as we welcome them, members of the house of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Uh, and I'm going to invite you guys at the end of the service, if you'll race back there with me so everybody can come by and, and officially you know, give you the fifth knuckle or the whatever. The... Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry that I didn't we'll do this again. Yeah, it, it won't be the first mistake I make. <laughs> so are you, uh, is she a, a member of a church? At this church already? Okay, so we're going to make you into a United Methodist. So let me ask you this question. As a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Okay, now, as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your work? In fact, she's already done that. She was one of the volunteers at BBS, so she's already going to be part of that. So, and so if you guys will be in the back, and we can get service so that I can reach you up here. Jesus said that his house will be a house of prayer. And so that's what we come here now to do, is to offer up our prayers, our worries, our concerns, our joys, uh, and we place them in the hands of God. Is there anything we'd like to, to bring forward this morning? Any others? What? Yes, ma'am. Anyway, thank you. Any others? We we just experienced the joy. We just got two new members. We, we did. Yes. We got three new members. <laughs> yeah. 
that's always wonderful. So it's a very special part of my life when, when you get to be a part of that. So, any others? Yes, ma'am. And, and y'all do do take care of yourself. I check the, uh, the 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 state COVID thing all the time just to see where we are because it's very important to me to make sure that each and every one of you are safe when we come to worship. And so I, I keep an eye on that. And we were up in the the, the highest category um, at the beginning of the week. At the end of the week, I think we went down a notch. But uh, just just be careful out there. Okay, let's take these and any other unspoken we have to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, I just thank you for this time we can come together. I, I especially thank you uh, that you invite us to come and bring our prayer requests and our joys to you. Um, you love the sound of our voice. Uh, you, you love to hear from your children. And so uh, we offer these up to you, knowing that you will respond in your perfect way. Uh, so, Father, we place them all before you. Uh, and Father, we pray for our church. Uh, as we, we seek your vision and we seek to, to, to see what it is that, uh, that, that you created Grace Chapel to be, and we pursue that. Uh, Father, help us and guide us. Help us to ensure that it is your vision and not ours that we seek. Uh, Father, we pray for our community, uh, all the, the people that are outside these doors that are so precious to you. And if they're precious to you, then you know, they need to be precious to us as well, and, and they are. Uh, I thank you for all those that are part of this church that come and volunteer and work and uh, just dedicate themselves to building your kingdom. Uh, they are a true blessing to me and to the church and to the community. Uh, we thank you for all those. Father, we pray for our country. Uh, a lot of division, a lot of strife, uh, a lot of worries about economies and, and just all that. In the Ukraine, we lift them up to you as well. Uh, we've got tensions over in the Pacific right now. Uh, but none of it is beyond your control so we place it all in your hands father we also thank you for your son jesus christ who came and died on a cross so that we could be saved we could be restored to you uh, we just have to accept that gift uh, so father reach out to the hearts that that still need to to know him uh, and we just thank you for that as we come together to pray the prayer that he taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd just like to thank my church family for praying for me and the prayers that y'all gave me is the reason I'm here today. And nobody, I, which, well, two or three months ago when I had to get up again and say how much I thank you, it's getting to be a regular thing, but I'll tell you what, I've got a church family that just don't, don't quit. And you are the reason I'm here today.
That was wonderful. Gosh, that's so good. Thank you. Uh, so last week, we looked at what many people consider their favorite parable. Uh, we typically call it the parable of the prodigal son, uh, but like we saw last week, really it's better named the parable of the loving father. Uh, that's a much better name for it. And I just think that's such a great story. It's a beautiful picture of, of how a loving God responds to us. Uh, but, you know, Jesus wasn't finished with the story. Uh, there's a second part of the story that's too often overlooked. Uh, you know, we typically teach it as the prodigal son and there's this brother. Um, but it was important to Jesus, and so we need to pay close attention to what um, it says to us as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and read the final eight verses of this parable to you, uh, starting in verse 25. It says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the mu music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Um, so now here's the deal. I read an article this past week by a theologian who said that, that there is a case that can be made that all of chapter 15 has been leading up to this one moment here, to this final scene, uh, and that it is the most important story in all of Luke 15. Um, it, it's the case of the elder brother. That's the, the main reason. I found it hard to believe until I researched a little bit more, and, and I think maybe this guy is onto something. I think that maybe this part right here of the older brother is what was leading Jesus to tell these parables and is really the main message to it. So, you know, and, and you remember Luke 15 consisted of three stories. Uh, there's a story of the lost sheep, there's a story of the lost coin, the story of the lost son. Uh, but here's the deal. The reason that Jesus taught those stories was not because people were feeling lost, but because of those who considered themselves as not needing to be saved. Uh, and, and, and they weren't ready to welcome all of God's children into the house. Uh, these were the religious blue bloods. Uh, we're going to go back to the very beginning of Luke 15, uh, verses 1 and 2. I just want to read those to you because that really changes the whole context of everything that, that goes on. So back at Luke 15, verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the tax collectors and the sinners, they all came to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they begin to complain. Hey, look, this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. So it was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were complaining. And these complaints of those religious leaders prompted Jesus to tell these parables. Uh, and what Jesus taught them was that the, the whole earth is lost and found. People get lost, but because of God's love, people are also found. And so Luke 15, it kind of gives us the mindset of, of God as he looks at those who are lost. Uh, in his first story, there was a shepherd who had a lost sheep. He had 99 others. So why the big deal over one lost sheep? Um, businessmen out there, I mean, that's a 1% loss. That's, that's pretty acceptable. But shepherds, shepherds think like shepherds uh, more than they do a businessman. And so the shepherd left the 99 and went in search of that one lost sheep. And when he found the sheep, Jesus said it put it, the animal up on his shoulders. And he brought him back and he celebrated with a party. 
Uh, the Bible says that he rejoiced. And then the second story, it's about a housewife that had ten coins, and one of them went missing. And again, she, she had nine others. You'd think maybe she could do without the one lost coin. But she swept the house, she pulled up the carpet, she cleaned until finally she found that coin. And when she found that coin, the Bible tells us that she, she ran out into the cul-de-sac, holding the coin up, inviting all of her neighbors to come into a party because she'd found the lost coin. She rejoiced. And then the most famous of the Luke 15 parables, the story of the lost son. Uh, the boy that broke his father's heart by taking his inheritance and he took off into the far country where he partied and he partied until he found himself broke and working in a pig pen. And there he decided to, to try to scheme his way back into the family farm. So he came up with this, this well-rehearsed speech, another scheme, uh, to say to his father, and he rehearses it, and he starts off for home. Uh, he, he hoped that his dad would, would maybe give him a job on the farm, and maybe he let him sleep in the apartment over the garage. Uh, but what he found was a father who had missed the son. He longed to see his son. Uh, he kept looking down the road that led off into the far country. Several times a day he'd stop and, and he'd look and he'd see if he saw, you know, hoping that he would see his son returning. You know, the father had, had, had kept the porch light on every night, kind of like Tom Bodette in uh, Motel 6, for, for those that are old enough to remember that. And the father was so excited to see his son that he, he welcomed him back. Uh, he never gave the kid a chance to use that well-rehearsed speech he just welcomed him back into the family, and the father threw a party for the boy. The father said, go get the best calf that we have, and prepare it so we can have a feast and we can celebrate that, that my son was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, uh, but now he's found. So they begin to celebrate. And, and I thought about that. I thought, you know, us, us party-loving prodigals, you know, we love what the father did. Uh, we, we love the idea that uh, you know, a lost sinner is restored to the Father. Uh, we love the celebration over you know, one lost child that is found and saved. But you know, this celebration infuriated the older brother. You know, the, the older son was angry. And you have to think, why, why would he be angry? And, and it's not really hard to see why he was angry. Um, he was outside the house and he's thinking so this is how a guy gets noticed and recognized in the family you go out and you get drunk you waste your inheritance you you come home and, and you just ask for forgiveness and you get a party thrown in your honor that's what he's thinking so he sits outside the house and he pouts and he pouts and he pouts and so we, we kind of had this parable within a parable um, it's the, the, the parable of the older brother. And, and it's actually, it, it's, it's not an easy one. Because on the outside, this son, he, he looks so good. I mean, here's the deal. The, the older brother, he was clean. He was proper. I mean, he kept his room straight. He, he got good grades. He played by all the rules. He was an altar boy in the temple. Um, he showed up all the time at church potlucks. Um, his resume was impeccable. His credit score was 849.9. His loyalty unquestioned. While the younger brother was out sowing his wild oats, you know, the older brother was home sowing the crops. Uh, on the outside, he was the ideal son. But on the inside, he was sour and he was hollow. Um, he was overcome by jealousy. He was, was overcome by anger. Uh, he was, was bitten by envy. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and he felt that he was the, the victim of iniquity. And when his father came out to meet him, to try to get him to come in and join the party, to, to rejoice over this brother being found, the older son went through a list of all the things that had gone wrong for him, uh, listing all the atrocities of his life. 
I'm going to look again at verse 29 through 30. It says, But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeying your orders. You, know, you, you, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Now here's where things begin to get interesting. Um, everybody, let me just warn you, watch your toes. Um, do you remember what prompted Jesus to tell the three parables? Way back in verse 1 and 2, the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, church people, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So before we get too tough on the older son, we, we need to remember those stories were written for the church. Uh, they were written for the religious people. And they're written for you. And they're, they're, they're written for me. Jesus is speaking to, to those of us who resent the return of the prodigals. We turn up our noses at the arrival of the pig pen smelling kids as they come through our door. You know, we like the family of God to be clean and to be tidy and organized and, and predictable. You know, we, we don't like somebody showing up who's going to, I don't know, smell up the place. We don't want prodigals to come in because we know that we can't trust them to keep the place the way we want it to be kept. The way it's always been done. I hate that phrase more than anything. Uh, we know that prodigals, you know, like any time a church has an influx of new people, they're going to bring change. I know a church in Texas that had the opportunity to have a, a small dying congregation, a Hispanic congregation, uh, come and join their congregation, to join their church. Uh, but the, the mainly Anglo church said no. Why? Because they didn't want to have to add in some Spanish songs, uh, some, some Hispanic traditions. They didn't want to have to add tacos and beans to the potlucks. You know, prodigals have seen God from a very different perspective. Uh, they, they sometimes have experienced God in a more spirit-filled way. Uh, when you come from the depths of prison or the, 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 the prison of drugs or whatever, uh, you see God in a different way. There's sometimes a very spirit-filled way. You know, the, the, the drug addict who's experienced God. They, they sometimes, you know, sometimes they're still a little bit dirty though. They're, they're still a little smelly. They're still a little rough on the edges. Prodigals will bring change. And that Anglo church isn't there anymore. Um, here's the problem. God never told us to, to screen his invitation list. Uh, and, and really, isn't that what those, those Pharisees and teachers of the law were doing? Our job is to welcome the children that he rescues and, and not to screen out the people that we'd rather keep out. Uh, here's the deal. The, the truth of Luke 15 was really put to a test in the early church. Uh, I want to look real quickly at Acts chapter 15. Uh, but before we kind of look at that chapter, uh, here's a little bit of a background context to what we're going to hear. So in the early Acts church was established by Jewish Christians. Uh, but a revival broke out among the non-Jews, the Gentiles. Uh, and this revival was increasing at a rapid rate. The revival, the, the expansion of the church began with Cornelius in his household. And then it moved to Syrian Antioch, in which many people came to Christ. And then there was Paul's very first missionary journey, where Paul and Barnabas decided to turn their attention to the Gentiles. So all over, Jews and Gentiles were coming to Christ. And this led Luke in Acts chapter 4 to write this. God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And that's a big door. So the thing is, this, this isn't a big deal to you and me. In fact, this is why we're here today. But it was a huge deal to those Jewish Christians. New Gentile converts was troubling news for many of them. So in Acts chapter 15, <coughs> verse 1, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers 
Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And then, as if the circumcision wasn't enough, we later read in verse 5, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And, and the, the thing is, these concerned Christians were Pharisees. They're Christian Pharisees. But, but Pharisees nonetheless, and, and we recall whom the stories in Luke 15 were addressed to, to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. In this case, in, in Acts 15, uh, these are the older brothers in the New Testament, in the New Testament church. Uh, they, they are uncomfortable at the sight of all these, these Gentiles coming into the worship assembly. They're, they're uncomfortable with the sight of all these prodigals coming back in. You know, and here's the deal. The Pharisees, they were famous for keeping religious rules. And if you study them back you know, before the, the, the resurrection, before Easter, I mean, they were big on rules. You know, they, they spent their lifetime attaining salvation the old way. They earned it by keeping the law, uh, by belonging to the right nation. Uh, and, and when these unkosher Gentiles begin showing up at their churches, these gatekeepers got upset. So they decided to add in a few stipulations, a few regulations. Um, and in their hand, the, the good news of God's grace became the bad news of their requirements. Well, when Paul, of whom grace is his favorite subject, he sharply disagreed with them. Uh, in fact, most scholars agree that, that Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians in response to the problem of these Pharisees. In the letter to the Galatians, he calls them false believers. And he later wrote in verse 16, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. That's about as clear as it gets. Here's the deal. Paul wasn't going to budge on this. And it became apparent that these, these Christian Pharisees, they weren't going to budge either. So a council was called in Jerusalem to discuss this issue. So back in Acts 15, verse 6, it says, The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Now, this is a turning point. A turning point moment in the history of the church. And the church is still in its infancy stage. But it's already having to wrestle with the core message of the Christian gospel. You know, is salvation brought by Christ on the cross sufficient? Or do we need to add to it? Um, was the work of Christ adequate to save us for eternity? Or do we need to add our efforts to it? Either circumcision, keeping the law of Moses, something else. You know, do we have to add something to his works? The Pharisees said, yes, you do. You have to add something. And it's not that they didn't trust Jesus' grace. They did. They trusted in Christ's grace a lot. One writer I read called them the grace a lots. Uh, they trusted in grace a lot. To them, salvation was a rowboat. And you get your paddle, and God gets his paddle, and we row together. You know, we do our part. God does his part. And we're out there. We're all rowing together. We depend on grace a lot. Peter and Paul, however, were members of a different group. They were the grace alones. Peter and Paul believed that grace alone saved us. They trusted only in Christ. So Peter, uh, in this council in Jerusalem, he stands up and he says, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart shows that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just like they are. In other words, what saved the Jews would save the Gentiles. Not saved through gifts or tithes or actions, but saved through the grace of Jesus. That's it. Peter stood firmly in the camp of the grace alone. Uh, so did James, uh, James the brother of Jesus. 
And so James is about to speak up. James, he was a very respected man of prayer. And according to a legend, uh, James had knees like a camel because he spent so many hours in prayer. James was a pillar in the church. Uh, so James stood and he says this, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who were returning to God. Uh, in other words, if God accepts them, we accept them. And I urge us to do the same. I, I totally understand that, that there is this temptation to filter out God's guests. Uh, and, and we've seen it. In others, of course. But, but there is a temptation even in us uh, to stand on the, the moral high ground and look down on those whom the Lord brings to our door. Here's the deal, though. If Grace Chapel behaves like God's church, if we are making disciples of all nations, uh, being His witnesses, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, we are going to see a lot of prodigals. We will be blessed. And I do mean blessed by the appearance of people who have messy lives, drinking problems, failed marriages, prison records, insurmountable financial debt. Some of them, they're going to be too broke to eat or some will be too wealthy for their own good. And they're going to smell a little bit like pigs. For they've been where we've all been. You know, they've been in the pig pen. And if we're not careful, that, that older brother, that older sister will, will, will rise up within us. And we'll start adding a few more rules, a few more requirements. All in the name of keeping the place clean. Uh, but the problem is, those, those rules and regulation can turn us from a from grace alone to grace a lot. And, and grace a lot's not ever going to get us very far. Um, here's a, a great example of how grace a lot works. Uh, back in San Antonio at our new church plant, there was an elderly woman. She, she was an amazing saint. She took great pride in inviting as many people as she possibly could to our church. And so one day, one of her friends whom she invited gave her life to Christ. And she wanted to be baptized. And at our church, we would do the typical you know, sprinkle kind of baptism. Or we would do a full immersion baptism. We had an old horse trough that we would bring in and we'd fill up with water. And her friend, she was older later, wanted to be fully immersed, even at her advanced age. I think she was close to 90, 80s, 90s. Uh, so the day came, the trough was filled, and the time came for her baptism. And she, she leaned over at me and she whispered, I'm a little nervous about being put all the way under the water. And I'm like, don't worry. You know, I'm, I'll be holding you. So we started, and her friend was standing up front by the trough just as, as support. And as I lowered her friend down into the water, she, she reached up and she grabbed me by the arm for added security. And I didn't think anything about it. So I, I lowered her down into the water. I lifted her back up. However, one arm did not get wet. I thought nothing of it. But the lady from my church, she looked at me in shock. Baptize her again. Her arm did not go under. The, the thing is, I, I know where this lady's concern comes from because it, it appears within me as well. It, it appears within you. Um, it's that tendency to, to depend upon um, our perfection and our own work more than the perfection and the work of Jesus Christ. And so he, here's the deal. You know, legalism trusts in rituals more than Jesus. Legalism trusts precision more than Christ. Uh, and you know, are, are we doing it right? You know, are we saying the right things? You know, legalism is the pursuit of perfection. Whereas grace is simply the admission of sin. Uh, the complete dependence on the finished work of Christ on the cross. So, big brothers and big sisters, they, 
they don't ever go into the party. They, they never do. And for them, you know, belonging to God is, is like the big brother in the story. Um, it's about keeping all the rules. It's about being sad that you did not get your party. You know, it's about kind of looking down on the prodigal son or daughter who comes back. It's about keeping a list of all the things that he or she did that we've never done. And legalism is no fun. Legalism brings us no joy. And here's why. Because there's no end to legalism. There's always another class to attend. There's another person to help, another mouth to feed, another book to read. And if I'm using these things to save me, when do I know when I've done enough? Where do I finish? How do I finish? When can I rest? But for grace alone, they just rest soundly in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Um, I saw some people up in Cone's Mansion a, a while back. It was in the spring. They had hung some hammocks uh, under some of the trees so they could, could rest and look out over the mountains down towards Bass Lake. Um, and I think that's what it's like uh, when we rest in the finished work of Christ. Uh, no more keeping all the rules and regulations that are put forth by the older brothers and sisters. There's no more legalism, no more anxiety. You know, ha have, I, have I done everything right? Have I, have I done enough? We, we need to make sure that the invitation to God's table, to, to God's house, has no restrictions. Uh, we need to ensure that our church offers nothing but pure grace. Uh, we, we need to, to guard against the modern Phariseeism. And, and, and Pharisees who think that Jesus needs help. Uh, guard your heart. As the Apostle Paul uh, said in 2 Timothy, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ. Uh, so here's the deal. Jesus wouldn't have said, It is finished, if it wasn't. But he said it, so it is. When prodigals come stumbling home, your Heavenly Father is the first to stand and to give them a welcome. May we be the first to stand along with Him. Uh, because no way wants to miss the party, right? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, we thank You. Uh, we thank You for Your Word. And we confess that um, arrogant spirits is still alive and well. We pray that Grace Chapel can be a place of acceptance where we can find that balance between love and truth and that we can keep the welcome mat out and we can celebrate every prodigal who comes home. And we pray that you would bring them home. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Closing hymn, hymn number 357, Just As I Am.
Sandy, you want to get y'all a head start while we... Christ be with us now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.